Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Attack of Opportunity. Sorry, I don't have Matt doing the layover today. Today, with me, well, actually, sir, why don't you introduce yourself? All right. Well, my name is Rev, and I am the uh, producer and GM of The Crit Show, uh, which is an actual play podcast where we focus on uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games, and our first season is uh, Monster of the Week. So before we dive into finer details of the podcast, let's get to know Rev. First question we always like to ask our guests in the hot seat is, when did you know you were a geek, a gamer, a nerd, a fantasy, sci-fi, superhero, spy, horror, etc.? One of us. One of us. Was there a defining moment in your life? Uh, you know, the thing that I can think of, because um, I was not the kid in high school that was picked on. I was the kid that was just not noticed. Like, I was that much of kind of the quiet person that I wasn't even noticed to be picked on. Um, but the kind of the thing that I remember as a defining moment is sitting in my friend's little room that he had built in his garage, reading, uh, reading issues of Nomad and the Punisher and like web of Spider-Man that his older brother had essentially pickpocketed from a grocery store, you know, and so <laughs> these were our contraband because his parents were very against any kind of violence. And so reading these comics and getting into these characters, um, that was kind of my first foray into uh, what would then become a very long walk down the nerd path of life. Ah, so comic books, contraband comic books, because they're just yeah, yeah. that much more dangerous and more interesting to read. Got you in. Very, very cool, sir. And what year are we talking? Are we talking like circa 19? Uh, that would have been around uh, 90. That would have been around 90. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. One second. I got a cat problem. No, no problem. <sighs> All right. One cat has been purged from the studio. Excellent. <laughs> Who left that door open? Um... So, fast forward, comics becoming into RPGs, tabletop games? Is that just a natural? Uh, no, actually, me getting into role-playing games was a just complete random... I was sitting in a... I'll just tell the story. I was sitting in a class uh, my freshman year of high school, and I sat in the back, and all the desks had these really old computer monitors on them. And the teacher from the front of the room was like, I can't see your face. You're too short. You need to come sit up front. And so I came and sat up front and I ended up sitting next to the person who would become my first game master. Um, and he was just, he was actually drawing a map when I moved. And uh, I asked him, I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, Oh, we, we play this game. And he didn't really want to talk about it, of course, because you know, kind of 94, it still wasn't, we, he was playing earth dawn. And, uh, but listening to him talk about it. And at some point I realized that one of my friends actually played in his group. And so they invited me uh, and it all came because I tried to sit in the back of the class and the teacher thought I was too short to see over the monitor. And so she made me move to the front row. Well, that sounds like fate to me, sir. <laughs> so I talk about, uh, or sorry, I read an article online about the 99% of the consumer that wish to be entertained and the 1% about the content creator that love blood sweat tears and certainly finances how much money goes into these projects um what uh what made you cross over into the you know i'm going to share my love of 20-sided dice for all or in your case six-sided dice that's yeah <laughs> um you know that's that's always been my passion um i i work in the entertainment industry for a living it's always what i've wanted to do it's it's what i have you know have my degree in. it's what i've strived for um, well let's talk the, about your your normie job yeah, so uh, I am, I work in voiceover, uh, I'm a stage actor, and I'm also the associate artistic director of a uh, small theater in Indiana, and so entertainment has always been the thing that drives me. I, I have this idea that if, even just for one night, if, if I can, if I'm doing a show or, you know, this podcast, whatever, and someone can listen to it for an hour, and they forget about their problem for just a little bit, and they have a laugh, in some small way, you know, that's done something to improve their day. Um, and so that's always been my thing is I, I don't know how to how to make things better for people, how to help out. And I've always found laughter helps so much. So I've, I've always wanted to entertain. 
have you have you gotten to the point with your podcast where your your listeners actually like reach out and contact you via email or or Twitter and you know that kind of thing and actually give yeah. you that little bump of like hey you you know you did something for me on a Tuesday, lonely Tuesday night yeah no I think that it's interesting because people always talk about how Reddit can be such a toxic place but at least as of right now and I'm sure the snake will turn around and bite me eventually but um, the people on Reddit and the Powered by the Apocalypse group and the Monster of the Week group have been very supportive. Um, I would say that we have more people listening that we don't know um, than we know, which is really cool. And so we'll get messages from people. There's a guy in Canada who um, every Tuesday night our episodes release at uh, 1201 on Wednesday. And he works overnight shift. And so Tuesday night, about 1159, he'll message me like, hey episode ready I'm like yep he's like okay and then like a couple minutes later he'll say just downloading and then about a half hour <laughs> hour later he'll just send me a comment about what he thought about it and it's this cool ritual with this you know person that i don't know i've never met and, yeah oh that's I, I could do you one better than that uh jacob wilson uh haunts our facebook and he's a podcaster he actually is on itunes with his buddy tom and it's jacob and tom conquer the world and they talk about nerdy stuff and um He's a big fan of one of our shows. And if I'm late editing them, he sends me like gifts of Spanky looking very impatient, drumming his fingers and, you know, he'll poke, <laughs> poke me with Facebook or whatever. So even that pressure of like, you go, oh yeah, my biggest fan, you know, I'll get you that footage. And that's like, it's another podcaster. So he knows you can't lie to them. You can't say, oh, well, you know, they know exactly how long things take. And yeah. There's no way around it, but that's good. No. Um, so you've, you're into live theater. Now you're re doing a recording of a podcast. Have you breached into like Twitch to actually do like a live show, which is a whole other bag of. Yeah, uh, actually. So we, because of my theater background, I started producing the podcast way before we actually started doing anything with it. Um, I spent about a year doing research, listening to shows, um, you know, going through games, talking to people who wanted to be a part of it. I, I produced it essentially just like I would a play because that's just how my brain was working at the time. And knowing when our launch was, I started to reach out to conventions. Um, and we actually did a live show of the show. I think it was like two weeks before the show went live. Um, and so, yeah, we've done four or five shows at conventions now. But then we also, maybe once or twice a month, uh, we will do a uh, live Twitch stream of a game. It, it's not the main story. Uh, one of the other guys on the podcast, Tass, he runs a game. Um, and so I actually get to play, which is nice. That's cool. That's cool. I'd, I'd like to do that. I have the, um, I mean, there's me and me at real life, which is pretty overbearing, but, um, when you're, when you're doing a live stream, like you have this sort of game show persona of like, Hey, this is me, you know, a little, you gotta bump up the energy just to keep, you know, the herd entertained. And, um, we had a go at it. We did. Uh, but my guys are cool with being recorded. A lot of my guys aren't, you know, they kind of get deer in the headlights They kind of choke the idea that there might be you know one or two listeners and we we dabbled with a little bit of that but um we decided that a, a sort of a post polish product where we could add a lot of our shenanigans or whatever um so what i'm saying sorry to keep deflecting this back no, no. to my own little experiences is i have a great deal of respect for those that can actually do a live show and keep it together and i mean play into mistakes and write them off and that kind of thing and you know keep the energy going that type of thing. So kudos to you, sir. Um, now we talked about your regular job. We talked about your fans. Let's talk about the actual game that you're playing, the, the, the podcast. Do you have more than one? Uh, so the main story, the first season is uh, Monster of the Week, but we actually have played, um, we're doing some bonus content, um, which is we're playing Worlds in Peril again, which is another Powered by the Apocalypse game. Uh, and then we have plans to play, uh, actually we were at Gen Con, and we met the creators of the Warren, and we met the creator of one of the creators of Thousand Arrows. Uh, and Thousand Arrows is a game that just is getting ready to launch, actually. And so we did a uh, let's play for them to put on their launch. Um, so we actually haven't released that yet because we're waiting until they release it. Um, so we've done four now, or else we'd rather have the plans to do four. Um, and in my head, the way the story for the Crit Show works out is that each season will probably be a different Powered by the Apocalypse game but it'll connect the stories will connect but it will be different worlds oh right on right on we uh now getting back to your the, the show that i know the crit show 
Yeah. Uh, you use a plot, a poc- like you're not using a D20 system. It's the apocalyptic system. Yeah, it's the powered by the apocalypse system, which is two D6. Okay. So how does that work as opposed to like a D20? Can you like just for a rough like if if you want to do a skill yeah. check or an attack, how does that work basically? Because any one of our listeners probably are familiar with a D20. The 20 represents all things that are chance. You look at your yeah. character sheet. There's a slight modifier whether you're attacking or using a skill, and you go to town. You apply it to a DC or you apply it to an opposing role. In the 2D6 system, how does that work for you? So the 2D6 system is much more narrative driven. Um, it is. You know, because we initially were going to play Pathfinder. That's what we all play. That's what we're all used to. Um, but just us as kind of entertainers, um, out of the, the four of us on the show, three of us have performance background and one of us doesn't. He's just a good storyteller. Um, and so we actually shifted to Powered by the Apocalypse because it was more um, it was more focused on the actual storytelling than the rules and the dice rolls. And so the 2D6 system, you basically you roll your 2D6 when you want to do very specific things. If it's a mundane thing, you don't have to make effort to do it because you are kind of powerful in this world just by the fact that you are you have a playbook and those playbooks have moves. Um, and so, so, sorry to interrupt. Is that like saying so you have a party of guys and it's like, well, your character class or your job has got this covered, so it's a gimme because the DC for like D and D would be like five or ten, like you know, the easy stuff. Yeah, something like that. If so. it's you know, it, well, it'd probably be easier just for me to. Uh, to say what they are so in monster of the week you have things like investigate a mystery kick some ass protect someone and as you tell me what you want to do you know if you walk into a room and you see that there's this giant werewolf attacking a woman and you're like oh gosh i want to go over and i'm going to push it out of the way and i'm going to hit it and i would say okay so are you trying to hit it in a way that you're trying to kill it or are you trying to hit it so that it gets away from the woman and you would say you'd make that choice oh you know what i want it to get away from the woman and so i'd say okay roll protect someone the role you make is dependent on how and why you're doing the action. And so it's not a, there is not just an attack role. You might act under pressure to attack because all of a sudden you've been flanked by someone and you didn't realize they were there. Um, and then on those roles, you have two D six, a, uh, a zero to six is a fail. Things go to hell. They go absolutely wrong. And again, that's just up to me to decide how does this go badly? A seven to nine, most of the powers have a choice. It's a mixed success. So you can do it, but there's going to be a problem. Yeah, you can push this monster out of the way, but it's going to get its claws into you, and you're going to take a couple points of damage. Uh, and then a 10 and over is a full success, meaning you get to do exactly what you wanted, exactly how you pictured it. Okay. Okay. So converting us to, <laughs> to be like 10 and under in a D20, no bones. 10 to 15, yeah. you're getting there, but there's problems. And 15 above, you know, so you have your 50% mischance, you have your 25% stacked up to 75% with, uh, yeah, you did it, but... And then there's like the clean 75% are over because it just breaks down into math. And that's just, this, that's just a parallel comparison that I wanted to draw for the, uh, you know, for the Uber gamers. Now, is there is there a meta in this? Is there like, hmm, what do you have a player look at his character sheet going, it's easier just to kill it than to try to protect her, even though that's better for the story. Like, do, is there like a DC that's lower that the players go for? Uh, no, there's not. You know, the, a success level is a success level. They might make a choice to do something a different way because one of their stats might be higher. Like they might not be very tough, but they might be. Uh, they might have a lot of weird, which in this game is magic, and so they might try to find a way to use magic to do the thing instead of their brute strength, which would give them a little bit of a bonus um, for their roll. You have your your five stats, and you know your stat can be anywhere from a zero to a plus three and so you add that to the total of your 2d6 right on there's something else i want to ask you about the system um going back in the day the early systems of DD were heavily based on stab xp stab xp you know for them to advance and become heroes and become more powerful and get more toys they had to farm xp and the the addiction just to wipe out what's in front of you as opposed to bargain with or whatever. But you were in a dungeon. There was monsters. It didn't matter. But one thing I hate about playing cities is dealing with the city watch or cops or dealing with civilians. You know, like unless you really have a guy with an oiled mustache and he's twirling it with the woman tied up on the train tracks or sorry, the victim tied up on the train tracks. Um, people are like, oh, we'll kill him. Why? Because we don't want a recurrent villain. You know, it's like, but you'll have blood on your hands. You know, why are we getting arrested? Why are we? Because you know, it's manslaughter. It's vigilantes, you right. know. Um, and the early days, no one cared. But getting more and more into city-focused and more story-driven games or whatever, um, Pathfinder and, and D&D and stuff are rewarding 
the storyline, rewarding the hard choice, the tough choice, the risk of the returning villain versus stab, you're no longer my problem, thank you, and I level up. Um, does the apocalypse system have a, something built in where it reward? Like, obviously, it's like you said, it's hugely narratively driven. But is there something that keeps players a bonus, anything that keeps that carrot towards the light, as it were, as opposed to just becoming a bloodbath? Yeah, so you actually don't get experience in this game just from killing things. Um, the experience you get in this game is, so we run the mystery, and at the end of the mystery, there are questions that I ask in the story wrap-up. You know, did you solve the mystery? Did you save somebody? Did you learn something new about the world? Did you learn something new about one of the other players? And they answer yes or no to those questions, and the more yeses they have, the more experience they get at the end. And then during the actual gameplay, they get experience when they fail. So if they roll a six and under, they get a point of experience. Um, really, the only exception to that is someone might have a move that's like, oh, if, if you have seen a monster before and you kill it, you get a point of experience. But it is not like a typical, you know, any kind of video game where you kill the thing and it gives you points. The points come from solving the mystery or from failing because the idea in Powered by the Apocalypse system is that as you fail, you learn and so you get better. Yes, yes. He who succeeds the first time learns nothing. Yeah, thank so thank more, you, Batman. Early on, the more you fail, uh, <laughs> the faster, which is kind of unfortunate because my guys uh, roll pretty badly. We had one story arc where uh, one of the guys leveled up three times in the course of a five-episode session. That would be great. You will get your guys walk into the ultimate Scooby-Doo slash Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, and they're they're full of gear, they're full of hype, they're ready to go. You fast forward, and they're all like naked to the waist, tied up, scarred up, about to be eaten by the monster, and they're like they're so excited. We're like we're sucking so bad. We're gonna get so powerful. So much XP is coming well, our way. And it's funny you mentioned that because when we first started playing and we first started recording, you know, they would be in a bad situation. And they would roll a fail, and they go, "Oh, I got experience," and they'd be excited about that and be like, "Okay, okay, don't get too excited about that yet." stay in the idea of what's the ramification of what's going to happen to you now. Like we can get excited about the experience at the end, but don't get excited in the moment because your character, you know, is in that place of, Oh yeah, I didn't save that woman. I get experience. That's not how it works. And that's <laughs> we really should have saved someone. Yeah. Uh, but please, sorry, you can't, can't, can't be saved the woman. You have to like save the victim. We have to be politically correct. Yes, that's you right. know, you know, um, now your group, your guys, how many have you got in your party going? Like your podcast, how many cast members you got going? Uh, so there's myself and three other people. And then we're, I think we're going to add a fourth here relatively soon. Relatively soon. Sounds good. So where can we find your podcast? What, what platforms are you on right now? Uh, so we are on Podbean. We are literally on anything that you can download a podcast on. If you've got a potato with long wires and a good signal, you can probably <laughs> listen to it. So, um, I yeah, spent a couple of days just getting us onto, onto sites. We're on iTunes. We're on, you know, Google Podcasts. We're on Stitcher and um, Earwolf and just everything. Okay, well, let me, let me run down a big list here because I've, I've gotten flack from fans. They say, why, why are you here but not here? Or why are you not okay. splitting up your show? So uh, iTunes? Yes. SoundCloud? Yes. Stitcher, yes. Spreaker. Oh, I don't know. Oh, Spreaker. Spreaker is good. It can get you to Spotify. It can get you on iHeartRadio. It can get you I'm back on, on iTunes. I'm on, I'm on those other two that you just mentioned. Okay. He's he's, he's, he's <laughs> oh well yeah sure well wait he's just like madly typing trying yeah, to get his RS feed up in there. Um. And uh, like I know that there's the directories like Overcast and everything, which you can just give your fee to as opposed yeah. to paying um, the X amount. But um, no, that's great. I this whole uh, setting for your podcast, I forgot to ask. It's called Apocalyptic Games. What is the actual setting itself? Is it modern day with the supernatural among us, or is it modern day with supernatural as a parent? Like everyone uh, yeah. sees the monsters, or is this one of those? It is, a, it is Among Us. It's like Buffy, where um, yeah, Shadow Hunters, Buffy, all that kind of. Uh huh. Yeah. That you kind of have to do it covertly, uh, yeah. and our game actually takes place in Indianapolis. Um, oh, <laughs> part of part of the thing of our game, and it's it's kind of fun because you know it's it's such a heavily wooded environment when you come to actual play podcast, trying to figure out you know where do we fit, how do we stand out, what's interesting, what's dynamic, what's different. Um, the thing that a lot of our listeners really seem to enjoy is that our game 
my players play as themselves. So there is not that layer of, oh, it's the character's choice. No, 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 it's it's your choice. And a lot of times you'd think, oh, that's probably easier because you know what you would do. But really getting invested in the story, getting connected to NPCs, owning some bad feelings you might have is, is really kind of difficult without that veneer of character. Um, and so it's fun because they are playing themselves. And so there are things in their lives that we've had to deal with when it comes to, okay, this is your job. How are you going to get out of this job to do this? Okay, this is, you know, this girlfriend is here. She's going to be in danger now if you do this. How are you going to remedy that? Oh, you, you're you not pulling any punches. Like I thought you were talking about, like, the you know, oh, no, look, hey, everyone, we're cartoons. Like, we're in TV. You know, it's us. But there is that sort of layer of, if I were Buffy, what would I do? It's like, no, you're Bob, and you work in a grocery store, and uh-huh. you know that Ken's going to come and get you because there's a monster to hunt. How do you get out of? Yeah. So how do, yeah. how do your guys not get fired from their jobs or have they already okay. then it becomes uh, like an alternate timeline, right? Like, no, we're yes. <laughs> so one of them actually in the very first story arc. Um, and the thing that I like about this is it makes for very, um, surprisingly touching moments. Um, one of the guys, uh, had a really bad role and it caused a building that they were investigating to burn down. And when they were escaping, he lost his wallet. And so the police found his wallet, suspected him of arson and, uh, he had to basically the monster hunting organization that they worked for had to put him into hiding. So there's, you know, a five minute section of the show where he goes and he has to say goodbye to his parents and he can't explain why he has to leave his whole life behind. And it drastically changed how he started to see the world. Um, Cause you know, the, the thing that we say early on is that um, our story is kind of called the other side of the coin and it is our exact universe with this one difference you know there are monsters and so here's how this starts to branch off and how you know the world changes no that's great i mean buffy is done angel is done constantine got flipped over to occasional appearances and in, in comic and oh, sorry he's from a comic in um in cartoon form and he's on legends and yeah. shadow run shadow hunters is up in the air but look out rev is still going for fresh story what season are you on how how long have you been running this podcast uh, so we actually have only been running for a little over four months. Uh, we are, we just last yesterday, uh, episode 26 came out. Um, we put out uh, every Wednesday. Uh, so yeah, we, we are relatively new on the landscape. Um, we've been very fortunate um, with the, the listeners that we have um, and their sharing of it. Um, you know, the Adventure Zone actually is doing Monster of the Week as well. And I found that out just not long before we launched. They announced that, oh, we're doing Monster of the Week. And I was like, oh, no. But I think it actually helped us because there's a lot of people out there who have been looking for more Monster of the Week. Hey. Um, I thought it was going to hurt us, but it actually helped. So yeah, I would say, hey, man, I feel you, brother. I was very, very, very upset to learn that the r- original reason for Rollmongers two years ago, even though we've only been putting up content for a little over a year, was to run Pathfinder's mummy's mask i mean i even have the dice set unopened in front of me here waiting for that fateful day and um i'm a big fan of gcp and if they got into it i wasn't going to touch it and i learned of another state-based mummy's mask podcast called find the path and i contacted their dm for a possible interview and to you know ask questions and threaten him uh but he gave me some really good advice and i've said this before a couple times on air is uh he believes that the uh rising tide will rise all ships and it was it really kind of stuck me as like yeah i shouldn't be you know thinking of these people as competition you know the networking and everything and that that really struck me and i was glad that i'd been networking and reaching out to community but i'd always reached out to the little guy like myself i'd never really talked to you know the big fish out there um because unfortunately they're so isolated i mean they get contacted by hundreds of people and you know of course whatever I would say versus whatever, you know, the groupie or Bob would say or something, you know, gets mixed up in the wash. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the uh, reasons why, not that I've contacted you saying you're a little fish or whatever, but I am oh so happy when my fellow podcaster that I can help with their own show will do an interview with me and I can share their experiences with our listeners and maybe grow your listenership, you know, um, because they're the listeners you can't think of it like a sort of like, well, these are my fans, you know, or you get fans are like, I'm a critter, you know, crit is the best. Or, Oh, well, I'm a Canaanite. I love can. Well, but a lot of people, they, they listen to a bunch of stuff because they love the genre, 
you know, now obviously there's only so many hours in the day and you got to have your favorite podcast to listen to. You can't listen to everybody, but that sort of like, you know, these fans are mine kind of thing is not the way to go uh, in this business. So taking the first baby steps and working with people bigger than myself and working with people smaller than myself and our company, I just want to ask and learn and learn more mm -hmm. and, and get to know these people like yourself and the community out there that are that are doing this, that it's their journey journey. And sure, I, I constantly thread in my journey going, oh, that's cool. I did this, you know, kind of thing. It's not not for shameless hype, but so the listeners can compare going, OK, well, they're doing this with their show and this guy's doing this with that show. And, you know, and well, maybe I could do this, you know, which brings me to my final question, which no one ever asks. And someone actually on Reddit hit us up in a GCP subreddit when I was going on about something about our audio quality. Two people were talking about our audio quality and some were like, it's good, but I don't get it. They don't, this is sound disconnected. So it's like, well, I'm saying, well, most people have a round the table setup. We don't, we're virtual. We have no two people in the same room. And we use these microphones. We use Zencaster. We use OBS as a backup. We use Zoom for a face-to-face -face video chat, though we don't use the audio in it, and yada, yada, yada. And we do a crap ton of editing because that's the best we can manage. Can't necessarily get everyone in the house. Now, we recently did a second edition Pathfinder playtest, and we brought Matt Witt's equipment over from his dad's band that he's the front man in and singer in, uh, the, Harry P the Harry Peterson band, plug, plug, plug. Um, we set it all up in a big hurry because we were hours late and the audio quality is crap because everyone was too far off their microphone. One mic was dead and we didn't even know it. So all you hear is one guy in echo chamber, but we had a blast. There's like 10% gaming and 90% laughing and dicking around. And I hadn't had that feeling of like gaming at my table in a while, but gaming at your table with microphones in your face where you're playing for, you know, that's just, that's drugs. That's straight yeah. up adrenaline. I, I've been missing out. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you, if you can work it out, man, it is great to have the people around the table. And uh, yeah. So that big tangent of mine, sorry, um, is to ask you a technical question. If you don't mind sharing, you know, yeah. what kind of microphone do you guys use or do you use personally? Uh, so we actually bought some new microphones that we have not used yet. Um, but what are you using our, right now? So here's our strange little secret is that um, you know, one of the compliments we often get is our audio quality. We don't use um, cardioid mics. We just use a standard $9 microphone, and it is all the mixing afterwards because I know that this space echoes. I have a soundproof space that I do my actual voiceover in, and I know that this room is nothing like it. And so for me, it was more about um, the mixing after the fact than it was the equipment during I was very fortunate my roommate in college is actually a sound designer um, and so I was able to go to him and get some lessons on uh, mixing audio as well as equipment and you know whenever you find someone who works exclu exclusively inside of uh, of an area they can always go oh yeah you could buy this but you could also buy this and it's the exact same thing just with a different name on it and it's half the price and so that was a lot of my early kind of cost cutting and in, in the initial investment was talking to him to find out what microphones, what soundboard, um, compared to kind of what was the, the recommended by, you know, whatever shoppers on this site or that site. Rev, I think we should be friends. There's so much we, we I need to learn that we need to learn <laughs> in the, in the, uh, we've, we've been, as we've been learning podcasting, we've also been learning editing and constantly, yeah. like you said, you've got to up, we've been upgrading the mics. We've been learning more tricks and audacity post edit, you know, that type of thing. But the, the basic rule had always been, the better, cleaner recording you have, the more you can do with it. So you're talking, you're talking, it's like a $9 dynamic mic, the old school ones, uh -huh. as opposed to, now here's a quick lesson. Okay. A dynamic microphone has sort of a metal magnetized pin with a coil around it. And your voice hits the end of that pin and magic happens where the new natural, they call it your natural voice sounding for a condenser microphone is a thin plate inside there and it's energized and magnetized and it's supposed to give a more natural voice the problem yeah, being think, between I, go ahead sorry. i think too the thing that people don't realize is that uh, condenser microphones you know when you go through and edit your audio you you condense it um and that the difference between a lot of these microphones is whether it's condensing it in the moment 
or if it's making you do it at post. So we do all of our condensing as, in post as opposed to letting the microphones do it in the moment. Ah, uh -huh. well, I do know condenser microphones peak very easily. Yes. And that's something problem when I rave my voice. I've gone through several uh, and so much footage that just I had to throw out because crackle, crackle, and, and we, we call it blowing out the mic. Um, but that's that's good. We'll have to we'll have to get you back for just a specific um, you know tips with Rev on uh, on audio. You know, once you're big, once you're big, and you don't you that's know good. don't risk like you know boosting the comfort. I mean, there's tide that rises all ship, but you know there's yes. there's no there's no sense in like handing away every trade secret. Well, <laughs> I guess I just went against my own new policy. Yeah. Um, but um, so what did you just buy like we're gone you've gone from the you're chalking up to experience in the field which is rare and exceptional and great for your audio quality but for a basic setup like what have you got going uh so i just use a um we use a behringer soundboard and we process it through um through audacity uh and then uh, right now i've got it set up for four microphones and we are just using the kind of uh here's our like three of them for $35 Behringer microphones. Now we have some nicer mics. We got, uh, I think it was Cyber Monday, um, in case we get into a better space, uh, more like the microphone you're using now. I ordered five of them because they were like half off. Well, right now I've got the Audio-Technica 2035. It's the best mic I own, and it, it runs on phantom power where there's so many things like the Yeti, which is the Twitch standard, which is a direct USB mic where your computer will power it. This sucker uses the three big prong XLR yeah. cable from like stage mic, runs through a little unit for phantom power, 48 vo volts, and then that actually has an XLR that converts to a USB cable and goes in your computer. Now I'm assuming that your mixing board does the same. Yeah, so that so, you can actually record it via computer, it a whole bunch of you know stage setup goes in, but a lovely little at home computer USB comes out. And you plug mm -hmm. it in and record directly in Audacity. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yep. Okay. We kind of did that for a live show. We brought Matt's big mixing board over, um, and you're saying it's not in the you know it's not in the nine dollar or two hundred dollar microphone. Spent two hundred dollars uh, you know, Canadian on this. And I'm sure that there is, don't get me wrong, there is a huge difference, I'm sure, in, in quality of warmth and tone and less work put in during the edit process. But for me, it was more important to have, if my guys have to sit a little closer to the mic and I have to monitor out of the corner of my eyes their levels, I would rather have that than have, um, we, we, we recorded some of our bonus content with the new microphones and you just hear so much chairs creaking you know, the floor, echo, all of that um, kind of audio white noise just makes me so crazy that I knew I didn't want to start using them regularly until I was in a place where I could control uh, the tone of the room. Yes, keystrokes on the keyboard. Because we're virtual, you have the keyboard right, right underneath the microphone, and all I can hear is clickety click, click every time somebody uses Roll20. Yeah. Um, so you're one of the few people that I've met that actually run the game and run the tech mm -hmm. actually you're the first person i've met because i do this myself not only am i running a game i'm looking at four monitors of television and i'm running the tech because i'm recording everything on my end plus yeah. Ncaster kicks in and records on their end these guys show up click in their mics they can play after work in the jammies they can sit there with their dog and their wife on the couch and say you know Shh, quiet honey quiet rover you know we're recording the little red light is on and we go to town um now for you to actually monitor physical equipment as opposed to where I'm monitoring, like you said, corner guy, you got this big mixing board beside you or whatever. Do you find that you have to constantly stop the game because you're running it to, 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 to pull off both? Uh, early on, I did. Um, now I am comfortable with the levels and I can hear in the headset if someone's not loud enough. As, as I got used to the players and I got used to our equipment, I would say after maybe nine or ten episodes, I don't watch it anymore because... The levels are the levels. We don't change the levels. Nobody's really drastically changing um, their talking quality. And I spent a lot of time early on. I had I had the experience of working with a microphone a lot, but my other three, uh, my three players did not. And so we spent a lot of time. Hey, stay on the mic when you you know if you know you're going to get louder, you got to pull away proportionately from the microphone so that as you get louder and get closer, it's not going to blow the mics out. And so there was just all these little kind of training things that I kept drilling into them. We, we do, you know, uh, production notes after each story arc is finished. And it's like, 
hey man you got to be careful of those peas when you when you you know you got to knock your head to the side a little bit or um you know distance to the mic you gotta you gotta make sure you stay on there because i'm losing you here and it's causing us to do you know extra pickups or things like that so it was a lot of training based around my experience with broadcast yeah and they're all like okay dad we just want to play i get that a lot from my crew and yeah. they're, like, they're still teasing me there was uh clinton's car classics and i'm in the first season as a player and i had to leave the show but i still produce and co-produce and edit the show and they're still mentioning my name whenever somebody says you know call it your dice rolls okay jeff you know and i'm like my little tears like oh they remember me i'm still a part of this project yeah, it was it was hard early on, um, but now we're just all so used to it that it's it's not really an issue. Um, but it was it was it was it was like having a new puppy and training it right away. <laughs> like, okay, you can't scream directly the, into the mic, and you the, can't. The, the puppies show up and drink your beer and, and yeah. expect you to pay for the pizza. And I even had a guy <laughs> used to go game at his house, and he was on about the toilet paper you use because we would game all day. And it's like you you want me to bring my own roll of toilet paper to your house because we're yeah. depleting your. Sub- okay, dude, you know. Well, and you know, I and I should say on the opposite side of that, you know, I I am a harsh taskmaster when it comes to that stuff because it's just my background. Um, but the players are so great because, like I said, they are playing themselves and they have been forced to make some hard choices, and to really be able to open themselves up to how they feel about an NPC or how they feel about a story or if someone dies or someone's in danger, and to be sitting around a table with a bunch of people that you've gamed with for years and see them you know, coming to tears or seeing them choking up as they're trying to discuss something is really, is really for me, uh, enjoyable, um, because it kind of leans into this being somewhat of a, of a radio drama or, you know, an old, an old fashioned radio play, because there is that element of, for me, if it's not action, if it's not character driven or it's not humor, why is it there? Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, you come from the uh, the regime of like live show people, go, go, know your cue, stay in the mark, yeah. blah, 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 You know, once you have that discipline, even though these guys are relaxed and are not, you know, pros, but you said you work with several people that are actually have the uh, professional background. Uh, good for you. You're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of my crew are just like guys are like, come on, man, your buddy, please play. You're a good player. And they're like, okay. And they'll spend their Friday night. And, you know, they're not really invested in the role mongers brand. And then I have other guys that are stepping up with, with this and that, you know, to help ease the workload and the yeah, production. I think people recognize how much of a commitment it is to, to try to put out something like this. Um, and so, you know, it is it, everybody involved has to have, you know, some level of commitment because, you know, even your time is commitment, so it's it's really nice to have some people who. Oh yeah, uh, they they think I'm nuts. I've gone from role mongers actual play podcast to role mongers network because we have several podcasts, and they're like, we're concerned for your health, and burnt yeah. out. Jeff is like, you know, you could really help by just doing a little something an hour a week. That would be so great. Thank you. Oh no, they're like, oh no, no, I just want to play. Yeah, it's okay. great. Actually, our bonus content. Someone else is running. Tass was like, you can't. You, there's no way you're going to run an additional game every month so i will do this one it's like oh god i get to sit and play yay <laughs> i still have to edit it but you know what are you gonna do <laughs> no it's true i i miss playing i'm really looking forward to uh matt witt taking up the moniker of gm to do a possible future patreon goal of starfinder for us oh nice yes a little sneak peek in the, in the world of possibility but we have been talking to rev from the crit show you can find him everywhere on the net except spreaker oh well can't, can't have them all, but the big oh, ones, sorry. iTunes and, and, and uh, you know, SoundCloud and, and all the big hits. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today, Rev. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, you know, I'm really intrigued with the whole, you know, the Scooby-Doo. Do you guys do like Scooby-Doo endings or any, any throw out to the old genre uh, of Buffy? Are those jokes all worked in there? The thing that we are known for, the thing that I get messages for every week is that I manage with 95% accuracy to end on a cliffhanger. And so oh, yes. I, I do that element like, you know, Buffy or, or Evil Dead or so it's nice. Oh, that's awesome. And on that note, all right, you want to hit me with some levels here? Sure. Uh, let's see if this is a good place for me to be, if I need yep. to adjust anything. No, no, you sound good. You sound good.